All right, everyone. I am here with Karthi Natesan Ramamurti. Karthi is a research staff member at IBM TJ Watson Research Center, where he is one of the architects behind the AI Fairness 360 uh, offering that we'll be walking through a demo of today. Uh, Karthi, welcome to our demo cast. Thanks, Sam. Um, thanks a lot, and I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, I am really looking forward to diving into this topic. Um, you know, in general, fairness and more broadly, uh, trustworthy AI and uh, machine learning is an important topic and one that is, um, you know, there's a lot of interest in our community about. Uh, we had IBM at our recent Twomocon AI Platforms conference present on AI Fairness 360. And, uh, I thought it would be useful to maybe walk through, uh, you know, in some detail, kind of how it works from the perspective of a, you know, a data scientist or machine learning engineer that might want to use, uh, you know, more broadly think about, uh, you know, fairness and, and get an introduction to the kinds of metrics and considerations that one needs to think about when they are considering uh, fairness and anti-bias in their machine learning models, and then uh, more, in, more specifically, how you might use this toolkit to help with that. So uh, I'm excited to have you on to talk about these. Why don't we, uh, before we jump in though, have you share a little bit about your background and how you came to work on this kind of stuff. Yeah, so um, I'm, I originally have a, a signal processing background. So my PhD was in signal image processing. Um, so I, I like to say that I got into machine learning through the back door. Um, <laughs> uh, I haven't looked back ever since. So uh, when I started at IBM, um, we were working through like some cool uh, customer problems in workforce and health analytics and so on. And uh, at some point we started realizing that as a team, we started realizing that, you know, trustworthiness is important and, you know, uh, and uh, it also aligned with the um, strategic values of IBM. So uh, that's how I started uh, working on this a few years back. And uh, we have published a bunch of papers um, in fairness and explainability. And uh, we also have uh, toolboxes for fairness, explainability, and adversarial robustness. Mm -hmm. um, so all of these are open source. So um, yeah, it was really exciting to be involved in uh, developing AI Fairness 360. And uh, it has grown uh, very nicely into a, a good toolkit with a lot of uh, um, support from the open source community and a lot of people. Yeah. Great. Great. Now, a, a, a big part of what you're doing with the toolkit is pulling together implementations of uh, bias mitigation algorithms that have been developed by others in the community. Uh, as part of your research, are you also uh, developing new bias mitigation algorithms? Yeah. And are any of those included in the toolkit? Yeah, so we have included um, uh, one bias mitigation algorithm uh, from our own, um, you know, repertoire. Uh, and um, um, we are actually planning to include a few more uh, as we are developing it. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we have pulled in a bunch of things from others, but we also have our own contributions. And we want to use this as a vehicle for um, also like incorporating our contributions beside welcoming contributions from um, um, the open source community. And uh, we have a very active Slack channel. We have very active Git repository and uh, we keep checking it um, very regularly and uh, make sure that um, we, we are also, you know, a part of this and, uh, uh, you know, uh, we do what we can in order to um, make this into a, a, a really strong uh, toolkit. Awesome. So let's maybe start from the beginning. If I'm a, a data scientist or engineer that wants to get up to speed on um, the way to think about AI fairness and uh, bias mitigation algorithms, where do I go? Yeah, so, um, so I have shared my, um, shared my screen and uh, the website, the first landing page that you have to go to is uh, this, aif360.mybluemix.net. Um, so this is the uh, starting page for AI Fairness 360 Toolkit. Uh, so if you go into the home page, you can already see that um, there is a small introduction to the toolkit. It talks about uh, how we have implemented over 70 fairness metric and uh, 10 state-of-the-art bias mitigation algorithms. Um, and uh, 
how uh, we have also incorporated like um, several different tutorials and demos and so on. Um, so, and then if you scroll down and there is also like API docs and code, which we'll get to soon. But if you scroll down, you can look into like, um, what are the aspects that are interesting in this, um, you know, in this website. Um, so you can either read more about fairness concepts, bias mitigation concepts and so on, or you can try a web demo, which absolutely needs no programming. It's just a web demo. And uh, there are a lot of tutorials that we have given in a bunch of places. Um, and all the videos, at least most of the videos are available here. And uh, we have also published a paper on AI Fairness 360. So you can read that. Or you can, if you want to just go into like um, Jupyter Notebooks, if that's what you are, uh, you can click this and look at the Jupyter Notebook tutorials. Um, and uh, besides the two tutorials we have, we also have like uh, notebooks for every bias mitigation algorithm that we have in the toolkit. Um, so you can look at that. <clears throat> and uh, and or more importantly, you can just join our AF 360 Slack channel, ask questions, make comments, and you know, like um, tell your experience about the toolkit. Um, we are very open to, uh, you know, like uh, we are very open and receptive uh, to external feedback. And uh, um, you can also contribute. Um, I mean, since like I, I want to mention that this is a truly open source toolkit. I mean, we developed it, but anybody can contribute and you know like um, provide their thoughts and uh, fix bugs or help with pull requests you know do all those kinds of things that you do in an open source project and uh, these are the two um, uh, tutorials we have uh, credit scoring and medical expenditure and we'll go through both of them and these are the 10 bias mitigation algorithms we have and uh, these are some sample metrics we have um, so yeah, so all these can be found in the first page itself. So it's a very rich uh, page that contains a lot of information and leads um, leads the user to many different places. Awesome, awesome. So where are you going to start our uh, our walkthrough, our demo? Yeah, so I already showed the first page. Um, so maybe the first thing I will do is um, introduce some concepts related to bias and uh, fairness. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to do that uh, as a user, I'll take a user perspective and say, oh, I, okay, I'll first, you know, um, go to resources, right? So I look at uh, the overview of the toolkit, you know, for example, um, why we need AI Fairness 360, because we want to engender trust in AI. And uh, so it has a Python package, tutorials, notebooks, and these are the um, uh, papers that are uh, a part of the toolkit, right? Now, if I want to just know about um, the terms that, um, you know, like for example, what is bias, what is bias mitigation algorithm, what is a classifier, uh, what is a fairness metric, uh, what's a favorable label, unfavorable label, and what are the three different types of bias mitigation algorithms like in-processing, pre-processing, and post-processing, and uh, what is individual fairness, what is group fairness. So all those kinds, kind of things can be um, read off um, from this uh, from this glossary. Um, so I'll probably just go through a few of them so um, so that you know uh, we have a good grounding for our conversation. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. good. And in particular, from the perspective of a, a practitioner who, again, you know, hears about the topic constantly, you know, may have, um, you know, dealt with some kind of, you know, understands the concepts of, of data bias, you know, generally, but really wants to get uh, a grounding of like the top, you know, two or three concepts that they really need to understand yeah. to think about it from a fairness perspective. So uh, that would be great. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> essentially- and not to uh, oversimplify the, you know, yeah. that you know, someone's gonna learn three concepts and then be an expert. No, I think it's a good place to start. I mean, it's better to start with like a few basic mm -hmm. concepts rather than trying to um, learn a lot of different things. And uh, um, one of the, I mean, so basically um, we have this guidance material um, that we created um, by thinking about what a data scientist would, would be looking at uh, when, when he or she wants to use the toolkit, right? Mm -hmm. um, for example, um, there are like a few aspects um, that you have to be careful about. The first one is the data set itself, right? So we have to make sure that the data set has uh, a well-defined protected attribute. Um, so uh, AI Fairness 360, at least, um, you know, we, we need a well-defined protected attribute that we can measure bias against, right? Um, uh, so because the way the, the fairness uh, 
bias, the, the, the term bias that we define here um, is with respect to a protected attribute, like um, whether the um, proportion of outcomes for you know, different groups are similar and those kinds of things are the ones that we deal with here. So there should be a def definition of protected attribute and we should also know uh, what a favorable label is and what an unfavorable label is, right? For example, if you look at, I mean, it's it's not that hard to understand, at least in common applications. Like if you look at credit approval, surely right. approval is a favorable uh, label, right? And right. De getting denied is an unfavorable label. Uh, but there may be some complex applications where we really don't know whether um, um, whether this or that is the favorable label, but there has to be a clear definition of favorable and unfavorable. Yeah. So if you ha if you know all that, then we can um, then we can use, start using the toolkit and uh, you know like uh, figure out um, um, figure out a, a bunch of different things about your data first. You know, like first, what do we and the the next thing we want to look at is metrics. So uh, whether um, you want to have like think about like individual fairness or group fairness. Um, so individual fairness means that um, similar people should get similar outcomes and group fairness means that um, the outcomes for each group uh, must be similar. So for example, the uh, proportion of favorable outcomes for um, women must be similar to the proportion of favorable outcomes for men. Uh, so that's what group fairness means. So that is another concept that has to be grasped. And um, even in group fairness, there are like two different kind of worldviews. Uh, the first one is um, we are all equal, which means that um, um, if you if you think that um, regardless of what the data says, um, each group should have like similar favorable outcomes and uh, similar unfavorable outcomes, then that is um, that is the worldview of we are all equal. Whereas by what you see is what we get worldview. Um, so. So the observations, it, so in this worldview, we think that the observations reflect the ability with respect to the task. So there are like um, different uh, metrics that are corresponding to these two different worldviews. So uh, can you elaborate on the, the what you see is what you get uh, worldview yeah, like, and how that one is different? Yeah, like for example, um, the I, I'll probably like elaborate the example written right here. So, um, <clears throat> If let's say we assume that uh, SATs, we use SAT score as a feature for predicting success in college. Um, in we are all equal worldview, uh, if you look at like protect, if you look at the protected attribute of gender and if you look at men and women. Um, so regardless of the SAT score distribution, we would like to have like similar admission rates for men and women, right? But if you look at what you what you see is what you get worldview, then we assume that the SAT scores actually ref reflect. Um, uh, a good measure for predicting success in college, uh, which means that um, you know uh, you should be looking at metrics like equality of odds. I mean, like if you put put it through a classifier, it should be the same for both protected groups. So that's what uh, that's what is meant by what you see is what you get worldview. Okay. So um, it basically it's the it's the philosophy that you'll have in your head when you look at uh, fairness. Okay. So. Um, yeah, so once you are clear about the metrics, uh, then um, you can start thinking about the algorithms that you want to use. And here again, um, we have like, broadly speaking, um, we have three, three different kinds of uh, um, algorithms, bias mitigation algorithms. So um, we call them as pre-processing, in-processing, and post-processing. Uh, pre-processing algorithms, um, you know, like try to, uh, so, so to speak, correct the training data, you know, so that, um, bias in the training data itself is reduced. And uh, um, so, which means that uh, further down the pipeline, when you train a classifier or when you, uh, when you actually deploy the model, um, you won't have bias, right? So that is what reprocessing algorithm does. In processing algorithms, um, try to modify the training algorithm itself, like by regularization or some other means, uh, so that um, you won't, um, uh, so the so that bias uh, is reduced in the classifier or the training uh, or the uh, training algorithm, and uh, post processing means that um, you let's say you have access to only the outcomes of a classifier. Post processing means that you will you will actually change the outcomes in certain way, like not randomly, but um, in in a certain well defined way with some some constraints, uh, so that uh, group fairness is enforced. 
so the the reason why we have like multiple types of these bias mitigation algorithms is because the user may be able to intervene only in like certain parts of the machine learning pipeline um, suppose we have a customer model where um, you know there is um, uh, you already have a black box model and it's already providing you like outputs so so you can only use post processing right because you may not be able to go back to the training data and uh, you know like correct for bias mm -hmm. so that's why uh, i think you know like having a distinction between these three algorithm types of algorithms is important okay okay um so um and even if we consider like there are like some other considerations let's say we want to do pre processing or want to do in processing or post processing there are a few more considerations where um, that need to be taken into account. For example, um, if you don't want to change the feature values, right? You want to only change the weights corresponding to the features, then you use something called as a, a reweighing kind of algorithms, which basically like adjust the weight for the training examples, right? Um, whereas there are some algorithms that actually go and change the feature values in the uh, training data. And if you are okay with that, you can use those kinds of algorithms like optimized pre-processing. Um, this is one of the algorithms that we developed in-house and we have incorporated it. Uh, so it actually changes, goes in and changes the feature values, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so that is another consideration that we have. And uh, also optimized pre-processing can enforce both individual and group fairness, whereas uh, reviewing kind of algorithms can only enforce uh, into, uh, group fairness. So um, the other, uh, so if we come to in-processing, um, um, basically, um, if you have a neural network, for example, uh, you may want to use things like adversarial debiasing algorithm, which, which implicitly uses a neural network. Um, but um, if you want to just use a simple logistic regression-based classifier, you may want to use like prejudice remover. Um, similarly, uh, for post-processing algorithms, there are certain considerations. Um, like, for example, um, if you don't want any randomness, like there are some post-processing algorithms that have a small random component that will change the outputs um, so randomly, still with respect to constraints, but that will um, that have a small randomized component. So if you want to, if you're okay with that, you can use like equalized odds post-processing algorithms. Uh, but if you are not okay with that, you may want to use reject option classification. So these are like the you know really extensive set of considerations that um, we have um, when we when we look at uh, metrics and algorithms and so on. Um, so yeah, um, that's that's the the I think reading this just this resource page you know before yeah. starting to use the toolkit will be really important. You know it will give the user a lot of perspective and also a lot more details about what's there in the toolkit. It, it, it's screaming out for a kind of comparison table or a uh, flow chart or something like that. Uh, is, does something like that exist or does that oversimplify the, the problem? No, um, we actually, um, if you go to, um, I can show you like a comparison that we did in our paper. Um, so let me go to the code. Since you asked, I'm going to like digress a little bit. <laughs> and uh, um, so we have a paper in the um, in our actual GitHub repository. Mm -hmm. um, so it's an it's an archive paper, but it's very extensive. We also have a published version of this paper. Um, but I, if you go to the very end, um, this paper is actually also a good read if you want to get a really deep dive. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say this is the final word, but yeah. um, we have at least started something like uh, comparing. Um, you know, various different algorithms. Um, so LR and RF are logistic regression and random forest classifiers. And uh, we use that with um, the, one of the nine, um, you know, different um, uh, bias mitigation algorithms. So the reason why we have nine is the 10th one was a contribution that came after we published the paper. Okay. Um, so, and you can see, um, so here you can see the, the, um, the, the top row um, is before applying bias mitigation and the bottom row is after applying bias mitigation. And each dot corresponds to um, the, um, the operating point of the particular um, um, you know, um, classifier um, debiasing algorithm combination. 
So for example, here, the dark green dot corresponds to logistic regression, disparate impact remover. Um, and you can see the um, statistical parity difference versus balanced accuracy, right? So this is the accuracy metric and this is the fairness metric. So basically this is a fairness accuracy trade-off and uh, it's done with respect to different fairness metrics. And you can see how the dots move as you go from top to bottom as uh, because this is without debiasing and this is with debiasing. So, and this also compares like all the different, um, all the, at that point, all the different um, debiasing algorithms we had. So we have a comparison, um, some sort of a comparison that we, we got started, but uh, I agree that, and there are also like other works that do uh, different comparisons and we, mm -hmm. we did like more extensive comparisons in our recent papers, um, but and What are you the are right. here? Statistical parity difference, disparate impact, et cetera. Yeah, th these are like different fairness metrics mm -hmm. uh, that we are using. Um, so I can go over them, you know, like um, go back to the our web page and I'll, I'll go over them um, a little bit more when we look at the demo and all that, because okay. then we can see what the uh, things are. All right, cool. Yeah. But yeah, you are right. Uh, I think you nailed it, Sam. <laughs> 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 okay, great. Um, so... Yeah. So, um, yeah. So since we were in the, we were in the, um, guidance page. So, so these are the considerations that anybody, um, should have in their mind, uh, before they actually start using the toolkit. So I would say that before they even look at demos and all that, you should try to get some background knowledge about all these concepts. Um, and then jump into, I, I know it's very exciting to just start coding or, you know, start looking at demos, but, um, it can lead to a lot of simple questions, you know, like those can be answered if, if, if we just start here and, you know, read up a little bit before going there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah. Um, so those were the um, main things that I wanted to show in terms of resources. Um, so, so one thing that we wanted to do when we developed this toolkit was we wanted to have people who don't have a lot of Python experience also learn about some of the concepts. Um, so we created actually a web demo, you know, uh, with a few different combinations of data sets, metrics, and body biasing algorithms. Um, so, um, so I can show you a quick web demo and it, I'll also try to answer some of the questions you had about the types of metrics we had when I showed the paper. Um, so, so yeah, like, the, like I said, the first thing to do is to choose a good data set. You know, um, for example, we have like three different data sets here and these are also available in the GitHub page. Um, so, recidivism data set. So, um, so it predicts a criminal defense likelihood of reoffending. And there is also a credit scoring data set which predicts an individual's credit risk. And uh, this is a very popular adult census income data set. Um, which predicts whether an income um, exceeds $50,000 per year based on census. Um, so here, for example, um, we are showing like two different protected attributes. Um, like if you look at race, um, we say that white is the privileged group and unprivileged group is non-white. And for sex, we say that male is privileged and unprivileged is female, right? So, um, so one thing I want to point out is these things can change as the data sets change. For example, if you look at recidivism data set, the privileged group is actually female because they have, um, you know, I mean, they, they get, um, they have a lesser um, chance of, you know, getting arrested, whereas the unprivileged group is male, right? Uh, so these things can change as you, you know, switch between data sets. So we have to be really careful about defining the protected attribute as the first thing we want to know. And uh, if you want to learn more about the data set, you can click the learn more button and it's actually a UCI data set. Uh, so you can go in and learn more about it. So, um, so once you are done selecting the data set, I'm going to select adult census income. So, and there are also like little tool tips here, you know, that you can click throughout the web demo. So, uh, so you, when you click the next button, you will first check for bias metrics in the classifier that was trained using this data set. We use a logistic regression classifier in the background. Um, so yeah, here I might, I'll try to answer some of the questions you had, Sam. Um, okay. So let's, 
let's go to um, protected attribute sex, right? So privileged group is male and untrue is female. And accuracy without any bias mitigation is um, 82%. So we say that with default thresholds, bias against unprivileged group is detected in four out of five metrics. So let's look at statistical parity difference. So basically, um, if, you, if you look at this, so it's just the rate, a difference in the rate of favorable outcomes uh, received by the unprivileged group to the privileged group. Uh, so if it is negative, it means that um, the favorable outcomes received by the unprivileged group is lesser compared to the privileged group. So um, so basically, <laughs> the ideal value of the metric is zero, which means that both groups receive like equal amount of favorable outcomes or equal proportion of favorable outcomes. And here we define the default threshold to be between minus 0.1 and 0.1. We say that if it is between this range, it means that it is fair. But obviously, this is a choice we made and different applications right. can make different choices, right? Yeah. So is that clear for statistical parity difference? That is, yeah. Okay, great. And uh, let's look at disparate impact next because they are very related. So it's just the, instead of the difference, it's just the ratio. So okay. ratio of unprivileged group to that of the privileged group. And uh, so since it's a ratio, the ideal value is one, which means that both of them receive the same, um, same rate of favorable outcomes. Um, so we the thresholds here are similarly user defined or- Yeah, thresholds are user defined. We set it yeah. between like 0.8 and 1.2. Mm -hmm. um, but here you can see that it's 0.3, so it's definitely unfair according to our thresholds. Mm -hmm. So here also the threshold is minus 0.34, so it's definitely unfair. So um, let's then look at, next look at equal opportunity difference. So um, so this is actually slightly different because um, it looks at the difference between true positive rates between unprivileged groups and privileged groups. Remember I told you we are using a classifier in the background. Yep. So it will output a confusion matrix, obviously. So, and you can look at the true positive rates um, of the unprivileged group and true positive rates of the privileged group, and you can compute the difference. Uh, so in some sense, it measures the, um, you know, fairness of the pipeline up to the classifier, you know, like looking at both the data and the classifier and seeing um, what the true positive rates are between the two groups. Um, yeah. So, um, so, but this is only a part of the story. So we also have um, another um, fairness metric um, that talks about um, the average difference between false positive rate and true positive rate. So, so we are looking at both aspects now, both the false positives and the true positives. And we are doing an average, um, average of them, the difference between average between the difference of them. Um, so, so this, you know, this kind of incorporates both the uh, false, um, false positives and the true positives. So it's a little bit more. So again, we set the threshold to be between minus 0 0.1 and 0 0.1. Um, so TL index is actually a slightly complicated metric because it, um, it's, it's based on the concept of generalized entropy by defining uh, benefit. So each individual is assigned a benefit. And uh, this TL index is computed based on um, uh, as, a, as a generalized entropy of benefit for all individuals in the data set. Um, so here the fairness value of, uh, value of zero implies perfect fairness and uh, anything greater than zero is like unfairness. So this metric is not like, so this actually incorporates both uh, individual and group fairness because it's, as, you, as I said, like we are assigning benefit to each individual so, uh, and uh, um, you could also compute, you could also have a version of this metric that is, that's only looking at benefits of groups. So. Um, and how is that benefit assigned? Is it uniform or can you give it an arbitrary function or? Uh, it, I, it, I mean, it, it depends. I think the, the, the paper that proposes it has a very specific way of giving it um, okay. uh, uniform benefit. Uh, but. I mean, I, I'm, I'm guessing you could do it in various different ways, you know, um, but uh, yeah, so it's one of the metrics that is not used a lot in the literature mm -hmm. um, because most of us are looking at like group fairness algorithms. Those are the yeah. most popular algorithms, um, but um, you know, like we wanted to uh, put it out here so that we can also see how, how our debiasing algorithms influence this metric. Okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, so, so this is with respect to uh, gender. Is that clear? So it, it's like a nice visual representation that we have in the demo. Mm -hmm. um, so now, now we come to mitigation. Now we know that we have a bias in the data. 
and when we come to mitigation uh, we want to use uh, one of the you know the here we have uh, four bias mitigation algorithms um, that we have encoded in this web demo um, and like i said there are pre processing in processing and post processing algorithms so we have like visual representations of what pre processing algorithm does it changes the data uh, the in processing algorithms change the uh, you know the classifiers and the post processing algorithms change the predictions so um, you could go in and choose um, any any algorithm you want um, let me actually choose the post processing algorithm reject option classification and uh, we will look at um, how things change okay so now um, yeah okay so now we are looking at the same protected attribute uh, sex and uh, um, we will see that uh, the meeting after mitigation uh, it has come closer to um, uh, the fairness threshold which is between minus 0.1 and 1 and similarly here we see that uh, in terms of equal opportunity difference and average odds difference it's really really close to zero and in terms of disparate impact is much closer to one and in terms of tail index it has actually moved away from zero but not a lot Mm -hmm. um so um that's why i said it's not very well understood how these algorithms impact uh, tl index because most of the algorithms are de designed for enforcing group fairness yeah and are the the um equal opportunity difference and average odds difference is it you know generally the case that those are easier to mitigate uh you know, with this particular algorithm or at this stage or, um, you know, is there, you know, is there a pattern to that or is that just what? Yeah, like for example, data? yeah, so there is an algorithm called, um, you know, um, calibrated equalized odds difference or equalized odds difference. So their mm -hmm. objective function itself tries to okay. make. So, um, so, but, but the thing is like, mm -hmm. if you, if you look at these the, the plots that i showed you if we had read it more carefully you would have seen that most of these metrics are correlated so if the mm -hmm. debiasing mm -hmm. algorithm works well on one it likely will work well on the other but it's not entirely true you know like there are still variations uh, but some of the algorithms are designed to reduce uh, you know like um, um, for example some of the algorithms are designed to improve um, make disparate impact as close to one as possible some of them are designed to, you know, like minimize equalized opportunity difference or equalized average odds difference. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I mean, empirical studies are super crucial. I mean, there is no way to get around them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so any more questions with the demo itself? Um, nope. Do we get to jump into some code next? Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm going to show like two, uh, two examples of how we can use AI Fairness 360. Um, so before that, let me quickly show um, the code base itself. So this is the code base, github.com slash IBM slash AF360. Um, so, um, so if you go to AF360, um, we, have, we have these folders that are indicative of the capabilities, right? So um, we have the data sets folder, which talks about like what are the different data sets we have and how we encode them. And uh, uh, we have the metrics folder that talks about the different types of metrics we have. Uh, we have the um, classification metric, the binary label data set metric, um, and a sample distortion metric. And uh, we also have the algorithms folder that talks about in-processing, post-processing, and pre-processing algorithms. So all the code is available here. Um, so um, yeah, let me go to let me go to the examples. So I'll first pick this example: detecting and mitigating age bias on credit decisions. Uh, so, um, so I mean, for this, we use the credit data set. So um, as we see here, um, uh, the machine learning workflow is like this. So you have original data and you split it into training and test partitions and you have a machine learning algorithm. It provides a model and you take predictions. Um, so basically, um, in, if you want to use AI Fairness 360 on this, um, you need to determine um, in this credit data set uh, what is the favorable and the unfavorable um, um, outcome and also what are the protected attributes so um, 
let me quickly go into the code and show some of the things that we do here. So the first thing we do is uh, we load the data set. So, so you do like um, the statement actually loads the German credit data set, which is basically a data set with uh, credit approvals and denials. And uh, we also load a, load a metric class. Uh, so, um, and we also load a, 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 a bias yeah, mitigation that. algorithm. Yeah. So when, when we, and when you want to create the data set, you have to mention what is the protected attribute you want. Um, so for example, in the German credit data set, you could be looking at either age or gender, and we want to use age. So you say that the protected attribute name is age. And, uh, you also say what the privileged class is. For example, here, older people are considered to be privileged. Um, so you define a function that says that X greater than or equal to 25. So this is like capturing all the people whose age is greater than 25. And uh, you can also specify things like what features you want to drop and so on, right? And then like in all machine learning pipelines, we split the data set into training and test partitions, right? And uh, um, and uh, you define the privilege groups to be age age um, one. One means like greater than 25, right? Based on this lambda function here. And uh, zero means uh, less than 25. So um, so this this encodes the older people and this encodes the uh, younger younger folks. And you're, in your uh, features to drop, your dropping gender. With these tools, are you generally working with one protected attribute at a time? Um, yeah, I mean, you could, you, could, you could work with multiple protected attributes, but you have to define the privileged classes according to that. Okay. Yeah, you could work with multiple protected attributes also, yeah. Okay. So the, the way to think about it is, I mean, like for example, here we have privileged and unprivileged groups, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we have a way to like um, put in like more than one group here, uh, more right. than one uh, variable here as privileged. So the only thing you need to be careful about is not to have overlapping. Okay. Overlapping things or, or you know, like ignore some samples, ignore some examples because you did not like, um, so that, that combination is not present in that, right? So we have ways to like define ands and ors here. So um, the API documentation talks about like mm -hmm. how to define ands and ors. So the code has some examples there. Got it. But you basically have to define your <clears throat> protected classes yes. at, in such a way that even you know if you're doing it across multiple dimensions, you you're you know all of your protected classes are like perfectly mutually exclusive, and you're yes. not overlapping or leaving any on. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah so I mean, yeah, that's the ideal scenario. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now I executed this these two cells, and uh, so here, what I'm doing is, if you can see here, I'm using this. I didn't, I didn't talk much about what each of the metrics meant, but here, the binary label data set metric, um, what it means is that uh, we are going to look at the data set and check whether the data set itself has any bias, right? Mm -hmm. um, so for example, here, if you look at the binary label data set metric, um, and if you look at uh, the mean difference in outcomes, which is the same as statistical parity difference, it's just an alias. Um, so if you look at the mean difference in outcomes between the unprivileged and the privileged group, um, you have a bias. So, and that bias is, um, it, it is uh, it's unfavorable to the unprivileged group. Right, because it's negative. So that's the direction of bias. So what we would want to do is um, we, would, we would want to create um, a debiasing algorithm that can address this bias. So we choose the reweighing um, preprocessing algorithm because um, we want to um, mitigate the bias in the data set itself. Um, so we have already loaded the reweighing class. Um, so here we will specify what the unprivileged and the privileged group is. And we'll create an instance of the class. We'll create an object, and then we'll do a fit transform on that uh, training data set to get a transformed data set. Okay. So now, I mean, like you see, it's a very um, the paradigm is similar to scikit-learn. Um, so we have like fit fit transform uh, predict methods. Um, so we, I have you know like done a fit transform. 
So, and as you can see here, I executed this cell uh, on the transformed uh, training data and uh, the bias has in the training data. I mean, I have to say that it Just may not to be make sure I understand the transformation that we're doing is, are we balancing classes or values within the, we are balancing the, um, the groups. So yeah. uh, the favorable outcomes uh, for each group um, should be similar. So what we are doing is we are reweighing the individual samples such that it happens. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, it's an optimization. It's, it's not really even an optimization problem. It's just a mathematical formula that we do because it, you just have to balance this out. Um, so, um, so that's what this, uh, this, this is a very simple algorithm actually, but it's very effective. Mm -hmm. So you can see that, um, since it's not even a statistical optimization, you can actually in the training data, I'm not, I'm not saying in the test data, in the training data, you can bring the bias to zero actually. Mm -hmm. So, but the, the thing is like, you can even apply it. Like once you have fit this, you can apply it on the test data and, uh, most likely you will see a reduction uh, of bias in the test data also, even though it's not zero, it may not be zero. So, so this, this notebook is like a starter notebook. You know, it tells us a lot of things about um, how to import AF 360 um, and how to think about like the data set, the metric and the uh, debiasing algorithm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's just a gentle, I mean, like the summary says, yeah. just a gentle introduction to the functionality of AF360. Okay, you're just warming us up. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So it's just a warm up. So um, I have a more elaborate notebook, so I'm going to take a few minutes uh, to go through that. Okay. Um, so it's a, it's a tutorial on um, medical expenditure data. So in particular, what we do is, um, we want to do bias mitigation as a part of care management use case um, using medical expenditure data. Um, so I, I want to like kind of um, elaborate a few terms here. Um, so the reason why we need uh, bias mitigation in care management is because uh, before that, what care management means is that um, so certain high risk patients are uh, are isolated for um, you know specialized so-called managed care by uh, you know insurance companies and the system and uh, in order to do that you need to identify who those high risk patients are or who have like serious underlying conditions and so on um, so so and the reason why we want to do bias mitigation in the care management use case is because um, generally we, we know that um, from data we know that um, um, African Americans and in general blacks use the um, you know you, you have lesser utilization compared to whites so caucasians so what happens is uh, when you train a machine learning model in order to identify people who have high utilization um, african americans get um, usually have seem to have like the algorithm says that they have less utilization even though they don't um, so that's why it's important to like debias this and make it you know like uh, more equitable between the two groups Okay. okay. So that is the idea. And in order to identify these patients uh, for the care management scenario, uh, we will use classifiers built using random forest and logistic regression. And uh, we will um, detect bias using several different metrics, including disparate impact, average odds difference, statistical parity difference, equal opportunity difference, and TL index, uh, the same metrics that were used in the web demo. And uh, we will also use like three different methods uh, for um, bias mitigation. So I'm going to, um, in the interest of time and also to keep some time for like discussions, I'm going to only go through uh, logistic regression in detail because random forest results are similar and I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. Mm -hmm. So this tutorial is organized uh, um, you know, into uh, several different sections. Uh, the first section demonstrates the use case. So like I said, uh, the data scientist wants to develop a fair healthcare utilization scoring model. And uh, it may be dictated, fairness may be dictated by government or legal regulations. Uh, what the developer does is um, uh, she takes the model and the performance characteristics and, uh, and deploys the model in an enterprise app. And once the app starts making predictions and uh, starts scoring, um, 
it's it's given to the um, nurse um, and the nurses can actually evaluate the quality and correctness and provide feedback so now one thing about um, these bias mitigation algorithms is that as the data changes there can be a drift so once we identify some sort of significant drift uh, we'll be able to send the model back for retraining so it, this use case also demonstrates that okay. and uh, the data that is used here is from medical expenditure panel survey it's a nationally representative uh, data set of uh, um, non-institutionalized civilian population um, so it's run every year and uh, it's run in panels so we choose like panel 19 20 and 21 uh, for the demonstration um, so what we are going to do is um, we are going to create three different data sets uh, one from panel 19, one from panel 20, and one from panel 21. As the name suggests, uh, panel 21 and panel 20 are later than panel 19. Um, so what we will see is that we'll observe a drift uh, when a model train from panel 19 is deployed on panel 21 in terms of bias metrics. Um, and we'll go back and retrain using uh, panel 20 so that uh, the drift is reduced. Is that clear? Yep. Okay. Um, so for each of these data sets, um, we have um, sensitive attributes, um, uh, the race as the sensitive attributes, uh, whites are defined to be the privileged class and uh, non-Hispanic whites in particular, and non-whites including ev include everyone else. Okay. okay. Um, so um, so we, the features that we use are demographics, such as age, gender, active military duty status, um, physical mental health assessments, diagnosis codes and limitations. And uh, the outcome variable is a binary variable uh, based on a composite utilization feature. It's basically um, um, computed based on the number of visits you make to a, a, a healthcare facility or the number of home health visits. So if the number of visits is greater than 10, greater than or equal to 10, we define that the person has high utilization. Uh, so it means that they have to see the doctor and the doctor has to see them a lot, right? Um, so about 17% of the people are high utilization, okay? Um, now, uh, what we do is, um, like I said, we will we'll first build the model using panel 19 data and uh, we'll initially deploy it in panel 20 and uh, then also check what happens with panel 21. If drift is observed, we'll retrain and redeploy and see if the drift is reduced. Okay. Okay. So we'll we'll first look at how to load the data. Mm -hmm. So here, for example, we are loading um, MEPS data set panel 19, 20, and 21. And uh, we are looking at um, we are also loading the fairness metrics, the binary label data set metric and the classification metric. And uh, uh, we are loading the classifiers themselves, random forest classifier and logistic regression. And uh, AF360 also has some capability for explanation generation. So we are loading the text explainer. And uh, we are loading the um, fairness bias mitigation algorithms, uh, reweighing and prejudice remover. And uh, um, we are also loading the Lime package, which we which we'll use to show some explanations of why such decisions were given, right? So okay. this demonstrates that um, our, um, and we have AF360, um, Lime included in AF360. So this demonstrates that um, we'll be able to use uh, AF Fairness 360 with Lime models. Okay. So like here, uh, the first thing we'll do is we'll generate like um, training, validation, and test data using panel 19. So that's what, the, that's what the statement is doing, the split statement. Yep. And uh, um, so it's it, the data set is slightly bigger than the one that we looked at before. So it's going to take a bit of time to do it. Um, now, uh, in the meanwhile, let's look at um, how, what are the things that we'll look at the, um, um, look at in the data set. So we we'll look at the size of the data. And uh, we'll also look at the favorable and the unfavorable labels, the protected attribute names, uh, the privileged and unprivileged protected attribute values, and data set feature names. Mm -hmm. So the, this is loaded now. So uh,
Yeah, so this will describe the data set, which will basically uh, print out a bunch of um, interesting details about the data. Yeah, so here you can see that uh, the shape of the data and the favorable attribute names. Uh, and these are the features we use. Um, as you can see here, we have age, um, race, and uh, uh, census region, gender, marital status, active duty status, uh, limitations, uh, poverty category, and a lot of other things, demographic features. Okay. So the first thing we'll do is like look at the metrics for the original data itself. In the data itself, there is a huge bias. We can see that the disparate impact is 0.47, uh, which is quite less than one. So um, now we will also learn a classifier in the data. And uh, um, will plot plot uh, um, both the accuracy and the fairness. So at different classification thresholds, uh, the accuracy and the fairness metrics behave differently. So one thing I want to mention is that um, the the axis, the, the red axis here uh, is actually one minus minimum of disparate impact comma one, min one divided by disparate impact. So um, disparate impact should be close to one for fairness. And this metric should be close to zero for fairness. So that's one thing we have to remember. So the red curve must be as close to zero as possible. Okay. And the blue curve obviously must be as high as possible, right? But at this classification threshold where we get the maximum balanced accuracy, uh, we have significant bias. So we can see that the bias is greater than 0.5 in terms of this metric. So what we are going to do Yeah, and we are also going to look at average odds difference. So this is another metric. And if you remember, this also has to be close to zero, but this is like close to, uh, it's less than minus 0.1, which is also like significant bias. Mm -hmm. um, so at the best classification threshold, this is the bias that we have. This is the accuracy and the bias we have. The balanced accuracy is 0.77. Mm -hmm. and the one minus the spread impact value is this, and the average odds difference is this. So. As you can see that this is this is nowhere close to zero and this is not close to zero either. Although the balanced accuracy is like reasonable, right? It's 0.77, which is which is which is good. So um, now if you apply it on the test data, so that was on the training data. So if you apply it on the test data, the result pattern looks similar. Uh, so you get 0 0.77, 0 0.62, and minus 0.2. So what we are going to do is, um, I'm going to skip the random forest portion, although I want to quickly run this thing. Um, yeah, now we'll come to bias mitigation using reweighing preprocessing. Um, so as we saw previously, um, reweighing should work perfectly on the training data. Um, so you can see that disparate impact is like almost one. Um, because mm -hmm. it's just a mathematical um, modification that we are doing. So there is no optimization involved per se. So as I said before, even though um, reweighing can be like really uh, good with training data, when you, so we don't know how well it will generalize and test data. Usually it will generalize well. So what we are going to do is we are going to learn a logistic regression model after reweighing. So we are going to use um, the reweighed examples right and use a logistic regression model on that so you can see that um, so when you do the uh, yeah when you do the model uh, model fitting um, you have the instance weights listed here in the fit params so the data set dot instance weights which contains the uh, new weights for each example it's here um, so um, so we, we are basically learning a logistic regression model with the reweight examples. Okay. Um, so we are going to do the same thing, like look at the performance at different thresholds and pick the best threshold based on the maximum balanced accuracy. Um, so as you can see here, if you remember, it was close to this quite red curve. Yeah, much higher. Now it has come down quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And similarly, the balanced accuracy uh, hasn't reduced that much. Mm -hmm. around like 0.76. 
and uh, um, if you look at the equalized odds difference, it's almost close to zero. Yeah. So, which means that the method, you know, like it really works on the training data. Um, now, if you apply it on the test data, the results are not that bad either. So you get a balanced accuracy of 0.75. And uh, the this is like much closer to zero than before. And uh, um, average odds difference is uh, close to zero as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so any questions so far? I mean, I know I've been talking for a long time, so I yeah, don't no, uh, So far, so good. So okay, far, so great. good. Just on the balance accuracy, we want that to be close to one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, basically. Um, it's, and the threshold is where? The threshold is um, based on the maximum balanced accuracy you get. So if you look at this graph, um, so Got this it. is where you have the maximum balanced accuracy. So. Got so it. again, so like you, ideally you want like a ratio to your accuracy. I'm sorry. Do you, do, is this specified as like a ratio to your accuracy? So you are going to look at two different, two, the, both the classes separately and compute the accuracy and average them. It's better than just, so if there is a really uh, imbalanced data set, I mean, this is somewhat imbalanced, right? Only 17% mm -hmm. of individuals have high utilization. So using balanced accuracy is better because it tells, it treats both classes in equal weights, equal weighting. Um, so it's better than just using accuracy. So it's just a different accuracy metric though. Yeah. Got it. Got it. So like I said, I'm going to uh, skip the random forest part. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so we also have an in-processing algorithm, prejudice remover implemented here. Um, so here again, um, we say that uh, what we provide the sensitive attribute and uh, uh, we have a tuning parameter that we set for prejudice remover. And uh, uh, we'll do similar things, like we'll plot. So we we'll look at the performance on the validation data and the, the test data. So once this is done, um, yeah, maybe we can start looking at results here while the code is running. Um, so basically, the thing that you see here is that, um, yeah. Yeah, so again, you can just look at the graph and say that, you know, the average odds difference is really close to zero. But the balanced accuracy is a little bit lower here than before, uh, but this is a completely different uh, algorithm. Mm -hmm. And also the disparate impact, one minus disparate impact is very close to zero, um, which is also good. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's how the pre-processing and in-processing algorithms compare, you know. Got it. So if you look at the results, um, you can see that um, generally reweighing performs better than prejudice remover, even though prejudice remover is a specialized in-processing algorithm. Um, but some data sets can have like other kinds of behavior also. We never know. Right, but um, in this data set, it reweighing seems to perform very well. From the perspective of balanced accuracy, as opposed to um, necessarily one of the bias mitigation metrics. Yeah, even with bias mitigation metrics, um, reweighing is not that bad because um, you can see that, um, let's say for example, this, by the way, this is disparate impact. So this should be close to one. Um, yep. You can see that um, reweighing with logistic regression has a disparate impact of 0.73. Whereas prejudice remover has a disparate impact of 0.77, which is not yeah. that different. I was noticing the much lower value for random forest there. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it like even with uh, even originally, random forest had um, uh, actually random forest was better um, before debiasing, but it didn't measure up that well after debiasing somehow. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I mean, it really depends on the. So, so that's why it's like. Like I said, like there is no way to get around the empirical part, you know, it mm -hmm. has to be like vetted and tested for the kinds of data sets you want before you deploy them. And now uh, is it, is it interesting at all that, you know, I think we tend to think about these kinds of biases as originating in the data, right? And um, you know, if you look at the logistic regression and the random forest, they're both able to get comparable accuracy um, or balanced accuracy uh, being trained on this data, but then they have very dis di very different um, disparate impact scores. You know, for the 
presumably the same data. We're setting up our test uh, train yeah. validation sets similarly. Yeah. Um, you know, why, why would you say that is? Yeah, so um, I think the reason is because, um, I mean, one of the reasons could be that they are two different, completely different models. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, random forest, for example, is a, a, a nonlinear um, classifier uh, that's much more complex than a logistic regression model. Um, so, it's, um, so it could be behaving very differently on how it treats the reweight training data, for example, to a logistic regression model. Um, so yeah, that's how much I will say because um, like, I mean, if you, if you really want to be um, very conscientious about it, you have to actually test different different kinds of classification models and pick the best among them. So um, yeah. yeah, because yeah. the characteristics of um, the model, whether it is nonlinear or linear or whether it has like uh, good optimality conditions, all those can impact how much, um, how much bias correction can be done. Mm -hmm. Great. So, um, now we are going to deploy this on um, panel 20 data. So all we are going to do is just apply the logistic regression model on panel 20 data. So um, we are not going to retrain anything. For now, we are just going to deploy it and uh, see what happens. Like I said, the loading itself takes a bit of time because it's a slightly larger data set. But mm -hmm. we can see that um, the balanced accuracy has not gone to this minus disparate impact value is still um, somewhat close to zero. Um, and the average odds difference is uh, close to zero as well. So which is all good. Mm -hmm. Now, um, one more thing we can do with our toolkit is that we can generate explanations mm -hmm. for uh, a few test points using Lime. Um, so Lime is a local explanation model um, that can describe why a particular prediction, prediction was obtained uh, by uh, the machine learning, black box machine learning model uh, using, um, using a local linear approximation. So here, for example, we are going to pick uh, instances zero and two, which are basically the first and third instances, and see what happens um, in terms of the features, right? In terms of the explanation based on the features. So for, for instance, for um, um, instance zero, uh, the prediction probabilities are 0 0.7 and 0 0.57 and 0 0.43 for uh, low number of visits and high number of visits. And there are explanations in terms of features. Uh, for example, for low number of visits, uh, these are the features that are picked. And for high number of visits, these are the features that are picked, right? So as explanations. But if you take a different example, um, the features that are picked are completely different. For example, joint pain shows up here, whereas it doesn't show up here. So um, all this means is that you can use Lime. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of details about the features and all because there is a data dictionary that you can look at in order to understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, but all I'm going to say is that um, we will be able to generate like local explanations like this on to, to see why why these particular um, uh, you know predictions were obtained. Okay. Now um, we are going to deploy the panel 19 uh, model on the panel 21 data. Um, so we already did it on panel 20 and we saw that things were fine. So um, one thing I would note is that uh, the one minus disparate impact value has went up a bit. Went, went up slightly. So there is a, it's starting to drift a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so what we are going to do is that we'll see if this can be reduced by relearning the model based on the more recent data, panel 20 data. Okay. Um, so we can do the relearning thing here. Um, just like we did with panel 19, we can relearn the model using panel 20 data and again, deploy it in panel 21. Okay. So we're not training on our test data. We're here training on this uh, second set of data that we have and exactly. then trying yeah, that yeah. on the third yeah. set. So it's like you have these three um, blocks of data that came one after the other. Yeah. Um, so we are going to train on the more recent uh, data. Mm -hmm. So we can see that um, on panel is it 20. Some, is it from, track, from scratch training or are we also including the first set of data? 
we, we do it from scratch, but you could do an online training also. This is a demonstration that we want to show here, but you could do an online training also. And we see that when we deploy the panel 20 model on the panel 21 data, mm -hmm. uh, we actually get, it goes less than Down point. A little bit. Yeah. So, so it's the kind of this, I mean, this, this example kind of shows that, you know, like there's this starting to drift, but not drift a lot, but there can be more severe cases where it has drifted off quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we want to kind of the higher level point here is that you have to do this continuous testing, right? Just that, just because you have a model uh, that that is you think is free of bias in a particular data set, you cannot apply it on future right. data without thinking about anything. You have to keep testing and retraining if you want. Same thing that you'd expect to do to maintain your model's accuracy. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So that's the that's the story with this tutorial. So um, it's meant cool. to demonstrate demonstrate a bunch of things like how would you do this in a real world system this is very clear real world system because we are using like um, publicly available data that is really um, a gold standard data and um, and doing some um, things here based on uh, industry standard approaches mm -hmm. and uh, you know like also showing what are the best practices to do like um, look out for drift and uh, if you want you can retrain and uh, be careful about the bounds and the bias that you. All right. Awesome. Very cool. Very cool. Well, Karthi, thanks so much for walking us through that. Yeah. Thanks a lot. A lot of, a lot of good info there. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much all I had to say about um, the, um, the notebooks. And uh, I mean, I hope, you know, like you found it useful and uh, you know, I hope the viewers find it useful as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Thanks once again, anyone have any questions, you know, feel free to leave a comment and we will try to get those answered. Uh, but otherwise thanks for watching and Karthi, thanks so much for presenting. Thank you so much, Sam.